stumble and my dreams began to crumble. I'm out We're going to turn tonight to the book of Psalms, the 27th chapter, 27th chapter of the book of Psalms. I'd like to read one verse, and that's verse 4. <clears throat> One thing have I desired of the Lord, that will I seek after, that I may dwell in the house of the Lord all the days of my life, to behold the beauty of the Lord, and to inquire in his temple. Let's look to the Lord in prayer. Our Father, we ask that you would meet with us tonight. We know that this is the desire of your heart. I suppose that the most important thing is that we come here with a desire uh, to behold your beauty in this house and to inquire in your temple. This is a wonderful thing this is a marvelous thing to be able to do this. And I pray that it might be the one thing that we would desire tonight as we gather here, that it might bring honor and glory to you and be a blessing to us as we seek to serve you until you come. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. I was trying to think of a title for this message. I usually do not put much thought to that. I don't know why. But uh, Craig, every time I I speak, he'll he'll ask me after I come down out of the bull pit, what what's the what's the name of this message? And and um, so the the title I thought that I would give this message tonight is this. Hard life or simple life? A hard life or a simple life? One of the reasons I think the Lord laid this on my heart is because I'm forever running into people that are in desperate struggles in life. And I see people that are just stressed out, people that are overwhelmed. And I see this on a pretty regular basis. Um, people are struggling. I mean, people are are struggling. Their circumstances uh, are sometimes not very easy. And <clears throat> It's not possible to serve the Lord the way we should with the disposition that we ought to have um, if we're overwhelmed. There's no power in that. And there's no joy in that. And um, if we're not careful, the devil will rob us of our joy. He'll rob us of our peace, the peace that belongs to us that we ought to enjoy every day regardless of the circumstances in life. One of the things that came to my mind as I was thinking about the, the message was Acts chapter 9 and verse 5 where uh, the Lord said to the Apostle Paul, I am Jesus whom thou persecutest. It is hard for thee to kick against the pricks. It is hard for thee to kick against the pricks. I think this is not only true of people that are lost. I believe it's true of people that are saved. 
What did he mean? Uh, hard for thee to kick against the pricks. Well, you see, the Lord is trying to direct our lives. He's trying to guide us through this world in such a way that we'll pass by a lot of the difficulties that others are dealing with. And one of the ways that you drive oxen is with a, a goad. And you stick it in them every once in a while if they go too far to the right or too far to the left. And sometimes you'll have an ox that just kicks against the pricks. He doesn't want to be guided. Not the way the master wants the ox to go. And, and life is hard when we're not doing right, when we're not thinking right. And, and the Lord, because he loves us and, and wants to spare us of the hardships of life, he's, he's, got, these, uh, he's got this goad and he's, uh, he's trying to keep us in the, the straight and narrow, going the right way. Life is going to be hard if you can't kick against the Lord and what he's trying to do in your life. And as I think about some of the things that people are struggling with, things that sometimes just leave them overwhelmed, I believe this is the reason. The Lord is trying to accomplish something in the life. And we're kicking against the pricks. So life is going to be hard if the Lord's presence is not going with you. Now, I believe it was Brother Charles the other week uh, brought a message, and one of the passages I think he referenced was Genesis 18, verse 14, where we read, Is anything too hard for the Lord? Now, that, that's a wonderful statement. Yeah. I mean, I'm kind, of, I'm kind of reminded of, uh, of something Edith Schaefer, Francis Schaefer's wife, said one time. If your view of the Lord is small, your expectation will be small. But if your view of God is great, your expectation will be great. I've remembered that ever since I've read it. And that, that was... Many, many years ago, I read that statement, and it comes to my mind so many times. We need a great God. We need a God that can do anything. And he's able to do anything. And he says so. Is anything too hard for the Lord? At the time appointed, I will return unto thee according to the time of life, and Sarah shall have a son. Well, this birth was impossible by man's reckoning, but it was no problem for God, the Creator. And I, th I think that we need to fit this statement in to our lives into the various circumstances we may be dealing with and realize there's nothing too hard for the Lord. One of the things that we learn in Matthew chapter 11 about the yoke where the Lord tells us to take his yoke upon us and learn of him. He said, for my yoke is easy and my burden is light. Well, think about it. Here we are. We don't know how to live life. We have no strength to do anything. As a matter of fact, the Lord was very plain when he said, without me, you can do nothing. But we can stick our neck through that yoke on our side and we don't have to worry about anything because he's on the other side. And as long as we're yoked with the Lord, nothing's going to be too hard. It just isn't. The question is, have we got our neck in the yoke? 
That's the question. And so if you sense that you're being overwhelmed, uh, if you get up and you do not know the joy of the Lord and uh, the happiness that ought to characterize us every day, then we need to think about the reason why. So life can be complicated. And many find themselves overwhelmed, seemingly helpless, not knowing what to do. When these symptoms are realized, the cause should be readily identified. In Proverbs chapter 13 and verse 15, the Lord said, Good understanding, good understanding giveth favor, but the way of transgressors is hard. Now, you may have come here tonight thinking, well, I'm not a transgressor. I've just, got a, a, I've just got a bad situation. I've got circumstances that are overwhelming. But I'd like for us to rethink it. We should not be overwhelmed by circumstances. We absolutely should not. And the reason is because nothing's too hard for the Lord. And if we can't enter into life and the circumstances that come our way, thinking about some of the great examples that God has given us here in the Bible, such as the Apostle Paul. You remember all those hardships this man went through? The persecutions, being in the sea, you know, overboard. Um, perils. Constant perils. But this man was a powerhouse. And, and to be in this man's presence could not be anything other than an encouragement to you. So if the Apostle Paul could be a man like that, if he could, if he could, be, a, if he could be a man that would go on these constant journeys with all the persecutions and sufferings that he was having to deal with, and, and still have the power to, to stand in front of people and, and talk to them about how life should be lived victoriously, then isn't the problem somewhere in here or somewhere in here? The problem is really not the persecutions. It's not the perils. It's not other people and what other people are doing. It's not the circumstances of life. It's in the way we're thinking. So, I tried to think of some things tonight that might help us see the simple side of life. Because it shouldn't be complicated. It really shouldn't. One of the passages that came to my mind was this one right here as I was thinking about the subject. Psalm 27 and verse 4. David said, One thing have I desired of the Lord. Now, I like that language, and the reason I do is because he's not talking about 10 things or 20 things. He's talking about one thing. Just one thing. He wants us to think about just one thing. Well, as I was pondering this thought, something that came to my mind is uh, the fact that you can't really think about but one thing at a time anyway. Have you ever tried to think about two things simultaneously with equal intensity. You ever tried it? You can't do it. 
Have you ever tried to focus your eye on two things at different distances with the same clarity? You can't do it. Did you know that you cannot focus on but one thing clearly at a time? That's not accidental. It teaches us something. As a matter of fact, it kind of teaches us what we're reading right here. The importance of focusing on one thing, one thing, until we grasp the significance of this one thing, until we understand this one thing. And of all the things that could be on the mind of a man like King David, he says, when I think about my relationship with God, and when I think about the world and life as a whole, it comes down to one thing that I desire. And you see, his focus is on the Lord because it isn't the world. You, you're not going to get what we're talking about tonight from the world. You're going to have to look up. And see that our help comes from the Lord. And, and David understands this. He says, one thing have I desired of the Lord. And then he says, that will I seek after. There's determination here. And we're never going to get out of the ditch if there isn't some focus, if we're not focusing in the right direction. And if there isn't some discipline or determination behind that focus and he's got it here he's putting it in words and then he tells us what it is he tells us what it is that he desires of the Lord and it's this that I may dwell in the house of the Lord all the days of my life every day that I may dwell there in the house of the Lord all the days of my life. What he's talking about, you see, God, when he gave instructions to build the temple, he said, this is going to be my dwelling place. This, this is going to be my dwelling place. And so what David is saying here is there's one thing that I desire, and that is to dwell in the presence of God every day of my life and I know where that is it's in the house of the Lord we talked in messages past about the importance of Calvary Memorial Church one of the most important decisions you'll ever make in your life is where you go to church and the reason is because God is the architect of the church and this is his dwelling place where he meets with his people and so David is saying now, as I survey the life as a whole, it comes down to this. I know where the Lord is. And that's where I want to be. Folks, it's one thing just to come to church. But it's another to come here with this. One thing have I desired of the Lord. Now, if you're like me, and I don't think I'm too unlike most people in terms of our nature and tendencies. I can't count the times that I've just come to church, been so busy. I just come to church and I'm really not thinking like this with any depth. I'm just coming to church because it's Wednesday night or it's Sunday morning or it's Sunday night. And, and, and this is my pattern. This, this is what I do. But you know, that's really very superficial. But this verse right here, it, it, this is different. This is different. This is a man that is spiritually alive. He's spiritually alive. It, he, he realizes that there's something that he's lacking and, and he knows where he can get what he's lacking. And it's from the Lord. 
And so he says, that will I seek after, that I may dwell in the house of the Lord all the days of my life. I want to know his presence. And then he says, to behold the beauty of the Lord. To behold the beauty of the Lord. Now, if you're not careful, you'll read a phrase like that, and the thing that will come to your, 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 your mind will be things like, okay, uh, we're talking about seeing here. Like, if we were to see the Lord, maybe it would be a kind of brightness and a kind of visible beauty kind of thing that we would see. But I don't think that's what it's talking about. Not in the primary sense. As a matter of fact, Isaiah the prophet said that there was no beauty in him that we should desire him. So David must have something else in mind. And so the question is, what is it? Well, I think it goes deeper than what you see with the eye, which is very superficial. Uh, the eye can only see the surface of things. But David is talking about beauty here that has depth. There's depth here. Let me give you some things to think about that might explain how he's using this phrase here, beauty, the beauty of the Lord. There's a passage in Romans chapter 10 and verse 15 that says, How beautiful are the feet of them that preach the gospel of peace and bring glad tidings of good things. Now that's the kind of beauty that David is talking about. He's talking about beautiful feet. What can he mean by that? I mean, how would you understand a phrase like that? Even as Paul used it, how beautiful are the feet? of them that preach the gospel of peace and bring glad tidings of good things. Well, let's just think about a person that's maybe uh, lost. Maybe they've gone on a camping trip somewhere like people do from time to time. They'll go up into some of these mountain regions and they'll, they'll camp out and they'll go into the forest and all of a sudden, they'll do like I did one time up Linville Gorge. Went up there camping with a friend, and and all of a sudden it, it got cloudy, and you couldn't see the sun in the daytime. Uh, you couldn't see the moon at night. You couldn't see stars. You couldn't see anything. And so we had no way to tell which was east and west. And uh, another thing is we didn't even have a compass with us. We didn't think it was going to be like that. And so we got quite lost. We were lost in Linville Gorge. Thousands upon thousands of acres out there. And we were lost. Now... Let's just put the case that you were out there alone. You weren't with anybody. And you wandered around and wandered around out there until finally um, you ran out of food and you were tired and you needed something to drink and you just finally just came to the end of yourself. And it felt like life itself was just going to ooze right out of your body. And you finally, in despair, just fell on your face on the ground. And you were just lying there, lost. And you just sort of semi-passed out. And then all of a sudden, you lifted up your head and opened your eyes. And right in front of you were feet. Feet. And it was somebody that knew all about Linville Gorge. It was somebody that knew something about direction. You reckon those feet would be beautiful? 
You're mighty right. Beautiful feet. And I think that's what Paul is addressing. He's addressing the beauty that a person is going to behold when they, they see the feet of somebody that can change their circumstances. And that's what the Bible's all about. And the focus is upon the Lord Jesus Christ. And I'm certain when David said, One thing have I desired of the Lord, that will I seek after, that I may dwell in the house of the Lord all the days of my life, to behold the beauty of the Lord. These kinds of things were in his mind. The very thing that the Apostle Paul talked about. Because the Lord Jesus has come to us with a beautiful thing, beautiful message. And the message is salvation. What a beautiful thing that is. And the gospel of peace. When you're lost, you're miserable. You're frightened. It's a hopeless thing to be lost. But all of a sudden, you're looking at these feet. And there's a gospel there, a good news message for you. A message not of misery, not of fear, but a message of peace. And it all has to do with the person of Jesus Christ. Peace with Him. Peace because He has taken away our sin. That's a beautiful thing, folks. And he brings glad tidings of good things. Boy, I'm telling you, we got a, an amazing future ahead of us that know the Lord. And that's a beautiful thing. We're living in a world where people are, as it were, groping in the dark. Children of the night. People that do not know what's coming next. But we do. We know what's coming. As Brother Jed said, the King is coming. The Lord is coming. And he, he loves us. He knows us and we know Him. And He has a, a glorious future awaiting us that He wants to give us and He will. So that's a beautiful thing. Well, there are other things that might Define the beauty of the Lord. You know, the Lord had beauty before there was any world created. How would you understand the beauty of the Lord before the six days of creation? The Lord was beautiful before there was a physical world where men's eyes could look upon beauty as we know it. And so, what is the beauty of the Lord? Well, again, I don't think it's something that's visible. I think it's something that's, that has to do with his nature. It has to do with his character. It, it has to do with the virtues of God. And that's a beautiful thing. And, and to see these virtues even manifest in those that know Him because He gives us His nature. He gives us the divine nature and when He gives us the divine nature the beauty that David is speaking about becomes ours. And it's a beautiful thing to behold in other people as well as the Lord. Such as love. I'm talking about real love. The caring type, which is foreign to man by nature. Man by nature doesn't know how to love anything but himself. He doesn't reach out beyond the self. And when it appears to reach out beyond the self, it's really uh, a deceptive kind of love that is really self-serving when it's searched out. 
It's a kind of love that's extended because of what you're going to get in return for extending it out. But the love of God is not like that. What is God ever going to get out of you and me? What could we give God? Why, why could he possibly even be interested in us? What is man that thou art mindful of him? What could God get out of us? Hell-deserving sinners. Well, you see, the beauty of the Lord is that he cares and he loves. And it's an outgoing thing. He doesn't need anything. And so his love is not selfish at all. He's the most selfless personality in the universe. He just loves us because God is love. That's a beautiful thing. Paul wrote to Galatians and talked about love, joy, peace, long-suffering, gentleness, goodness, faith, meekness, temperance. Those are all beautiful things to see in the character of God and in his people. When David's desire was to behold the beauty of the Lord, he was talking about beholding his holiness. In 1 Chronicles chapter 16 and verse 29, we read about the beauty of holiness. The beauty of holiness. That's the kind of beauty we're talking about here. David wanted to see the beauty of the Lord, the beauty of holiness. And David wanted it for himself. He wanted to be like the Lord. And you see, that, that should be us tonight as we come here, as we behold the beauty of the Lord, is to, to be like him, to be like him. Well, he can give us the enablement to do that very thing to be like him and to manifest these virtues that we're talking about here. In Proverbs chapter 20 and verse 29, we read about the beauty of old men, that being the gray head. Aging is not something to hide. It's a beautiful thing. And those gray hairs represent something that's beautiful. You sit down and you talk to somebody that's getting on up in the years and they're gray-headed, and boy, you can learn some things from people like that. They've lived a long time. They've gone through so many experiences, and they've been down roads that we haven't been down yet, and they can... They can advise us concerning what to look out for. Things that might be pitfalls that they fell into and they say, now listen, this is, this is not what you want to do here. But this is what you want to do here. That's a beautiful thing. And of course, the Lord is presented in Scripture as the Ancient of Days and the hairs of his head were white like snow. And it speaks of the wisdom of God. Bathsheba wanted to come and visit with Solomon because she had heard of his wisdom and she wanted to come and prove him with hard questions. What a beautiful thing it is. To know a person on this earth that knows the Lord, that you can sit down with and learn from them because the Lord has taught them some things over the years. That's a beautiful thing. So the simplicity in Psalm 27 verse 4 is one thing. One thing, I would like to encourage you to 
Find that passage in the Bible, Psalm 27 and verse 4, and memorize it. Memorize it. And think about it often. And ask the Lord to give you personal insight into what it means. Read it slowly. A word at a time, a phrase at a time, and let it soak in what's being said here. Because there's a simplicity here that we can get hold of that will be a blessing to us if we'll let it. In Luke chapter 10 and verse 42, <clears throat> the situation involved Martha and Mary. And you remember Martha was cumbered by much serving. But Mary uh, sat at Jesus' feet and heard his word. And when Martha came and complained about her sitting there, the Lord said to Martha, but one thing is needful. This is not complicated, folks. We can't think very clearly about but one thing at a time. And, and, and the Lord is, uh, is now getting Martha to focus on one thing. One thing. And the reason is because her life was complicated. She was cumbered. We, you've been, you've experienced that, being cumbered. I have. I don't have to live that way. I don't want to live that way. You've heard me say this before, and I'm not trying to be spiritual in saying these kind of things. I lived many years of my life on this planet a miserable human being. I have. And I'd say that back a pretty good long time ago, I got up one morning, and I met with the Lord, and I was talking to him about how miserable I was. And the Lord showed me that most of the problem I had had to do with my attitude, something that I did have some control over. I could get up in the morning and have a good attitude, or I could decide to have a bad attitude. And the Lord worked me over. And I made a decision. And the decision was I was tired of being miserable. Now, I don't want to be miserable. And I don't want to get up in the morning and, and have all these circumstances. And I'll tell you something. There, there's a lot of things that go on in life that get in life that get complicated. There, there are persecutions. Uh, there, you're going to run into people that do not like you. All kinds of things that can happen. Health problems. Uh, the IRS can get after you. <laughs> Your business can start going down. There are all kinds of things that can happen. But our happiness should never be controlled by the people around us or circumstances. Brother Kent told me one time, he said, you know, he said, if your happiness depends on how other people treat you, you are doomed. You'll never be happy. Happiness, folks, comes from the Lord. And many years ago, I made a determination. I'm tired of being miserable. And I want to get up every day. And I want a little strength about myself. I don't want to be crushed by anything and I don't have to be I don't and I'm saying these things as somebody that's trying to learn these things not because I'm spiritual but for the opposite reason I'm not I'm not spiritual but if you get it if, you, if you're miserable to the point that you don't want to live like that anymore, you don't have to. You don't. And that's the message of the book. We can be happy. 
And we can get up and we, we can have purpose in our lives. We can have focus in our lives. We can have a work to do for the Lord and we can be happy about it and we can have a good attitude. And I don't care what the circumstances are. The Lord tells us that He'll not give us more than we can bear. And with every temptation, He'll make a way of escape. And He says, my grace is sufficient. And so, if we get up in the morning and we're having a bad day, then is it God's fault? No, it isn't. You see, we want to blame everything else in the world but what needs to be blamed, and that's us. We're the problem. We're the ones with the problem. The problem is not other people. The problem is not circumstances. The problem is you and me. And we don't want to hear that, but it's the truth. One thing is needful. And Mary hath chosen that good part which shall not be taken away from her. It's very similar to what David desired when he said that he wanted to dwell in the house of the Lord all the days of his life. To behold the beauty of the Lord and to inquire in his temple. To inquire. This is what Mary is doing. She's sitting at his feet. This woman, I don't know what she's been through. We, we don't know. We're not told about her past. But I'll tell you this. I believe Mary was a person that had wandered around out in the woods, out in the bushes so long. She was just tired. And she gave up. And, and she finally realized, you know, I, I don't know how to live. I don't know how to live. I do not have any answers, but I have found somebody that does. And I'm going to sit at his feet, and I'm going to hear his word. I'm going to, hear, I'm going to do one thing. I'm going to do one thing. I'm going to listen to him. I'm going to listen to him. And that's what she did. She sat down in the presence of the Lord at his feet. And, and I'm telling you, she was consumed with his word. And that's the way we ought to be. We ought to get up every day. We ought to open this book. Folks, this is the feet of the Lord Jesus Christ right here. And, and, and any time we want to, we can open it up and it's, it's as though we were like Mary sitting at his feet. And if we'll stop just reading our passage and wasting our time and get into this book and realize what we've got is it's the innermost being of God in print. You can't get any deeper inside another human being than that of hearing their word. None superficial about it. It's deep. If you want to define what it means to be a person, you can't get any deeper than thought life. Thought life. The thought life of, of the person of God. You can't go any deeper than that. In the beginning was the Word. And the Word was with God. And the Word was God. And we've got his innermost self written so that we can read it with our eyes and think about it and let it soak in so that the innermost self of God becomes our innermost self. Let that mind be in you that was also in Christ Jesus. And that's what we're supposed to do. We're supposed to let it be our life, be our way of thinking. That's what is meant here in Luke chapter 10 and verse 42. But one thing is needful, and Mary hath chosen that good part which 
shall not be taken away from her. What was it that she did? What was the one thing she was doing? And the Lord was telling Martha, that's what you need to do. She sat at his feet and heard his word. That's the one thing. Life's not that complicated. It's as simple as one thing. In Galatians chapter 5 and verse 14, the Lord tells us something here that's so simple. He said, for all the law is fulfilled in one word. Love. Even in this, thou shalt love thy neighbor as thyself. You look at the law of God, and it's pretty big. You might even think of, it, think of it as being complicated. The Lord knows that. The Word of God and the law of God is a revelation of all that God is. That's big. So the Lord says, let me simplify. All of it is fulfilled in one word, love. We don't do enough of that. Caleb was talking in his prayer about being a little more affected by the fact that my sister is sick and he knows her. And, uh, and so you, you begin to be moved by people that you know. And you find yourself loving them. Loving their soul. That's important. It's real important. Because love is the fulfilling of the law of God. And we need to think more about love. You see, our, by nature, we, we hate. And, and it's so easy for that to come out in conversation and, and we cloak it in ways that it seems like we're being a friend to people by the way we're trying to frame our words. We have to be pretty artful at it, the way we frame it. But so often our conversation in, in describing people and the circumstances and whatever it is about them that we're talking about, and the conversation is technically not constructive. It's not with their best interest in view. So it's not a constructive conversation. We need to learn to be discerning about what is constructive in conversation and what is destructive. Love is constructive. It's a desire to build somebody up and want to see them blessed. That's one thing to talk about people when you really want to see them build up and want to see them blessed. But there's a different spirit in really not loving somebody. But talking in such a way that really what you're doing is you're exalting yourself above them and saying, I'm not like that. When God says, yes, you are. Yes, you are. Who art thou that judgest another? For wherein thou judgest another, thou doest the same things. We're not better than anybody. We're all the same. In our nature, we're a hell-deserving, monsters of iniquity, that's what we are. We're all the same. We're not equipped to judge. That's why when in the tribulation period there was a search in the universe for somebody worthy to judge, somebody worthy to open the books of judgment, there wasn't but one found. It was the Lamb. Worthy is the Lamb. He's the only one worthy to judge. We're not. So we got to learn to discern between constructive remarks and destructive remarks. Matthew 
Matthew chapter 6 and verse 33 says, But seek ye first. That's number one. We're trying to keep it simple tonight. The Lord is telling us how to live a simple life. But seek ye first the kingdom of God. What is the kingdom of God? Well, it's the place where he rules and reigns. That's what the kingdom of God is. And we want to be there. We want to be there where he's ruling and where he's reigning. Life can get real simple when we're in his kingdom. Where we know that with his sovereignty, which is big enough to control the entire universe, and it's endless, it's everlasting. He has the sovereignty to control every variable in the universe. Nothing is out of control. Nothing. Everything is in accord with his perfect will. And I'll tell you this. This is a marvelous, beautiful thing to see. Did you know that God's will will be done? It will. He's not a weak God. When we come to the end of the program, Jesus Christ doesn't lose anything. God's will will be done. And he's the king of kings and lord of lords. And when we're in his kingdom, we don't have anything to worry about. I mean, we, we've got politicians up here in Washington that think that their will is going to be done. No, it isn't. These people are going to die. A lot of them are close to death now. They're way on up there in that age where people have strokes, heart attacks, and all kinds of diseases and things like that. They can be gone overnight just like that. Their will is not going to be done. I don't know what in the world they're trying to do up there. But you see, we have the blessing of understanding that we've been, been, been invited by our Lord and Savior to live in His kingdom. And we can, we can live that now in the present, this very moment. We can be living in the kingdom of God, acknowledging that He is in complete and total control of everything. Nothing is out of control. And Jesus Christ has overcome the world. He says, be of good cheer. I've overcome the world. Don't worry about the world. I've overcome it. It's already done. And so come on into my kingdom. Don't worry about these dictators, these would-be dictators. Don't worry about these kings. Don't worry about all this stuff. Come into my kingdom. Seek ye first the kingdom of God and his righteousness. His righteousness. And all these things that people are so preoccupied with will be added to you. I'll take care of it. Don't worry about all these other things. It's not worth thinking about. Just think about one thing. Seek ye first the kingdom of God and his righteousness. And I'll take care of everything else. Folks, that's a simple life. How could somebody walk away from an offer like this? From the, the loving God who tells us how simple it can be. Solomon in his wisdom, Proverbs chapter 4 and verse 7 says, Wisdom is the principal thing. Wisdom is the principal thing. Wisdom is the first thing. We need wisdom. Very important. And Solomon is, is, is telling us how to live a simple life. We need wisdom. It's the principal thing. But where do you get it? Well, the philosophers didn't know. They thought by sitting around and, and dialoguing back and forth, you know, the Plato and the dialogues. If we dialogue, we can eventually answer the big questions of life. We can answer the hard questions that people are asking. 
The, the, the capability is in here. No, it isn't. It isn't in there. We can't answer the hard questions of life. But Jesus Christ is wisdom. He is made unto us wisdom. And Solomon is saying wisdom is the principal thing. He's saying Jesus Christ is the principal thing. Jesus Christ is the first thing. So if you're living a complicated life, you know why? You're not thinking about the principal thing. He says, therefore, get wisdom. And with all that getting, get understanding. Well, how do you get it? How do you get wisdom? Well, James tells us, if any man lack wisdom, let him ask for God. Is that complicated? I don't see anything complicated about that. Do you think the Lord... Uh, is, is sitting up there in heaven uh, uh, with this desire to tease us with complexity? I don't think so. Any more than you'd want to tease your children when their hearts are broken and when they're struggling and when they're miserable. The Lord doesn't want us to be miserable. And if we'll sit at His feet like Mary did, and hear wisdom. If we lack wisdom in any area of life, he says, I'll give it to you. I'll give it to you. If any of you lack wisdom, let him ask of God, who giveth liberally and upbraideth not. He doesn't say, Oh, listen, you ignorant so-and-so. Why should I give you wisdom? Look at the way you've been living. Look at your attitude. He says, I'm not going to upbraid you. I just want you to sit at my feet and ask me and see will I not open the windows of heaven and pour out wisdom like you've never thought about before. The Lord wants us to have His wisdom. He wants us to have it. I mentioned this earlier, John 16 and verse 33. These things I have spoken unto you, that in me you might have peace. In the world ye shall have tribulation, but be of good cheer. I love that. I love that statement. Be of good cheer. Why? I've overcome the world. Now the Apostle John talked about the dangers of the world. Lust of the flesh, lust of the eyes, and the pride of life. It's of the world. And you see, the reason most people are miserable is because of these three things right here. The flesh. The lust of the flesh. Lust of the eyes. Some people have got so many debts they'll never be able to get away from it. Because they've got to have this. They've got to have that. They're miserable because of it. And marriages, conflict in marriages... Because neither one has the power of God in their life. And so they begin to blame one another as this is the problem. You're the problem. There's no power in the life. And so when the bad remarks come, you don't have the power to react the way you should to people who say things they ought not. Somebody has got to get right with the Lord and have the right kind of attitude so that when the mate says something that should not have been said, you can just let it roll off. Take it to the Lord. Manifest the virtues of God. Learn to be patient. Learn to love. 
learn to understand that your view of the other, if it's critical, is without a real standing before God because you do the same thing. We're all guilty. What we need is to be converted. We need to be changed to be like Christ. And I'm telling you, when you've got Christ's life, when you've got his virtues in you, then you can handle a wife that has a bad attitude or a husband that has a bad, rotten attitude. If you're visiting with the Lord every day and, and spending time with him and you're you're dwelling in his house and you've beheld the beauty of the Lord and you've inquired in his temple because you got up early enough to do it then you won't be caught off guard you'll be prepared for a spiritual warfare where you're not a loser is it possible to live that way absolutely it is. Absolutely. Now, I'm not an example of it necessarily at all. I might say with Paul, not as though I've apprehended, but I press toward the mark. I know where to go. I've learned from this book what I'm supposed to do when I get messed up and I start being miserable. I'm not saying that I'm never miserable, but I'll tell you this. I have the tools that God has given me in his precious word to fix it. If I'll just get out of the way and let the Lord work on me, The last thing I want to mention to you is uh, Psalm 34 and verse 18. I love this verse. I quote it often. The Lord is nigh unto them that are of a broken heart and saveth such as be of a contrite spirit. If you want a word that pretty much describes what's being said here I mentioned it earlier it's attitude I've often thought about the subject of salvation and exactly what is it that the Lord is looking for when he actually makes the decision to dispense the gift and give a person everlasting life. What is he looking for? I've grown up in circles where people tried to convince me that it had to do with being able to understand the Romans road and ever so many Bible verses and the message of the cross of Calvary and the, the depths of the understanding that's involved in the atonement and sanctification and a lot of complicated things that theologians write about. And over the years I've discovered that's not so. What do you think the thief on the cross understood in the way of theology? In the way of theology, you know, the kind that you have to have ever so many things understood, repeat after me kind of thing, sinner's prayer. I changed the life where you're, you're converted in such a way that other people can look at you and know that you're saved. What do you see in the thief on the cross? I'll tell you what you see. This is what the Lord saw. 
the Lord is nigh, he's drawn to, he's close to them that are of a broken heart. And listen to this. And saveth such as be of a contrite or repentant spirit. That's all you can see in the thief on the cross. A broken heart. A man who owned his sin and said it. He said, we're, we're worthy of what's happening to us because of our crimes. But this man has done nothing amiss. He owned his sin. He was broken. He was broken. And he didn't want to be that way anymore. He didn't want to be that kind of person anymore. He wanted to be like this man. He wanted to be like him. And here was a man who was innocent. And he was suffering for things he did not do. But he had a great attitude. Who for the joy set before him. Endured the cross, despising the shame. That thief on the cross never seen anybody like that before in his life. Because there's none like the Lord. He's incomparable. There's none like him. And this is the beauty. He saw the beauty of the Lord. He saw something he'd never seen in a human being before. An innocent man suffering death. And he had a good attitude. And he looked down and he heard the words, Father, forgive them. They know not what they do. That's beauty. That's beauty, folks. That's beauty. That's the beauty of the person of God. And th this is what this man had that resulted in him being told, This day thou shalt be with me in paradise. Is life, is salvation complicated? No, it isn't. It is as simple as Psalm 34, 18. And if you're sitting here tonight and you've never trusted Jesus Christ as your Savior, you don't need a preacher to get saved. You don't need a church to get saved. You don't need a missionary. You don't need somebody to hand you a tract. Salvation is of the Lord. And this is what we preach in this church. It's not of the church. It's not of men. Salvation is of the Lord. And when you do like that thief on the cross and you look to Jesus Christ as your only hope for eternal life, he saveth such is to be of a contrite spirit. You have only one problem in life. One problem. You. That's it. It's that simple. So if you're struggling tonight, I'll tell you why. You. And the Lord is the only person that can fix you. You have to go to him. Let's pray. Father, we thank you for this time we've had to look into the scriptures. I pray that you would bless our hearts, our minds with understanding that we might apply these things or it doesn't do any good. This is our prayer in Jesus' name. Amen. Let's turn to hymn number 483 for a closing song. Hymn number 483, and we'll stand together and sing.
Like a river glorious is God's perfect peace. Over all victorious in its bright increase. Perfect yet it floweth fuller every day. Perfect yet it groweth. Let's look to the Lord in closing prayers. Mr. Art Rembert leads us. Father, we thank you for the time you've given us here. Father, when you hear a message like this, and you can't leave if you actually listen as we heard without the understanding of the, the simplicity of, of living a life. struggle of simply giving and turning over to you is, is just, I mean, it can be that simple. And the book of Psalms is a, is a, is a comforting, blessing book. Just pray, Father, that these things said tonight would search our hearts and we commit our lives to you in that very way. Thank you for the delight, the time it takes to, to study your word and the blessing that has, has come out of it. I pray, Father, that there is one here tonight that is doubtful, has wonders. Maybe they, they have you, or maybe they don't. Father, please, burden their hearts to just simply call upon you, turn their lives over to you. I do pray, Father, for those that are broken hearted over their, their loved ones. I know, Father, that, that if their loved ones are not saved either, I know that's the most important part. Thank you, Father.